Welcome to the SITREP Speaker Series. I'm Frank Thorpe, President and CEO of the United States Navy Memorial, and thank you very much for joining us. Today's live, interactive, online program is available to naval enthusiasts around the country. We have questions from the fleet today, some really good questions for our guest. And as you can see on the platform, you can ask your own questions. You'll be able to ask our guest uh, questions that are of interest to you about his area of responsibility. You can also like the questions on the platform. And I have an iPad here on my lap. And as we go through, I'll be looking at the questions. And the questions that get the most likes, I'll be looking to try to fit them into the conversation. I'd like to thank, in a big way, Navy Mutual Aid Life Insurance Company, who is our series sponsor this year. They are a great, great corporate partner for us, have been for years. And we literally could not do what we do without the great support of Navy Mutual Aid and other companies just like them. I'd also like to recognize the crew of the USS Gearing today. Uh, excuse me, the USS Kepler, a Gearing class destroyer. Um, they do a lot of reunion groups and uh, reunions, and uh, they stick together as a crew, which is really important. Uh, they've also done a lot of stories of service. On our website, you can read a lot about uh, the USS Kepler. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest. We're honored today to have the Commander of U.S. Naval Forces Europe, Commander of U.S. Naval Forces Africa, and Commander Allied Joint Force Command Naples uh, with us. Admiral Bob Burke is a submariner. He served on four submarines, uh, including command of the USS Hampton. He's been the commander of Submarine Development Squadron 12, uh, Submarine Group 8. And uh, through his tour, it, it would take forever to read through it, but through his tour, in addition to a significant number of submarine and nuclear power uh, command, uh, organizations that he's worked at, he's also been very involved in the personnel uh, business as well as the operational business with, uh, I think, at least four tours in the personnel business and uh, more than five tours in the operational world. A perfect person to be the commander of an AOR like Europe and Africa. Admiral Burke, welcome to the show. Thanks, Frank. I uh, really appreciate uh, you and uh, Navy uh, mutual aid putting this together. This is this is really a great opportunity for me. So thank you. Um, I'm really looking forward to the questions here, but I thought I'd just share a few thoughts about uh, what's going on in the, in the theater. Great. Uh, the European and African theaters are are as busy as they've ever been, and uh, I think uh, they're crucially important to, to the strategic national interests of the United States and, and frankly, the the, uh, the globe. Um, it was great when President Biden was out in Europe a few weeks ago. He renewed our uh, U.S. commitment to NATO and to Europe, um, and that was extremely important because we don't do anything in that AOR alone. Our allies and partners are extremely important to uh, everything we undertake. And I think we enjoy that, that network of allies and partners because we are like-minded. We've got shared values, shared experience, frankly, through history, and then uh, I think a common vision of what right looks like and, and what lies ahead. And, and at the end of the day, I think that network is really an asymmetric advantage for the United States and, and, uh, and against anyone that, that would face off with us. Um, I'd be uh, remiss, though, if I didn't point out that that network's been under strain uh, you know, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and, and the AOR has really become um, a crossroads of uh, great power competition. And there's a lot of reasons for that. You look at the trade routes, you look at the, um, you know, the instability that uh, is in certain regions there. Uh, and, and I think President Biden, when he made his visit a few weeks ago, put it, put it very plainly. Russia and China are on a deliberate campaign to uh, upset the international uh, world order and, and really specifically aiming at, at, at dissolving trust among our allies and partners. I can tell you that uh, military to military, Navy to Navy, um, no daylight between uh, the U.S. Navy, U.S. military, and any of our uh, partners' uh, services over there. We're working as closely together today as we ever have been. And uh, it's a joint effort. Um, it's, it's joint uh, on the U.S. side, uh, and it's joint even in the maritime service side. I've got hand-in-hand -hand partnership with U.S. Marine Corps in the theater and the U.S. Coast Guard uh, doing a lot of things side-by-side uh, -side with us. Uh, but again, uh, we don't do um, anything uh, alone over there. We have a number of uh, fundamental security challenges that, that we face over there, and I think um, everyone's uh, well aware, and we shouldn't make any, any mis mistake about the fact that, that Russia is a, is a challenge over there. 
Um, no signs that they're going to change course from this uh, campaign that they've been on to undermine the present international order. And I think it's important that we uh, also think about Africa. I, I don't think uh, the typical American uh, necessarily appreciates the strategic significance of, of uh, Africa to both the United States and the world. Uh, and I will tell you that both Russia and China are present in both Europe and Africa, and, and I hope we get a chance to talk about both those points a little bit in the Q&A. Um, the the kind of last thought I would uh, leave you with before we get to the Q&A is um, we talk, up, we use this term great power competition a lot, uh, and when you really stop and think about it, where is that competition really likely to play out? Well. The global commons are the open oceans. They're, they're the high seas, uh, the, the international waters of the world. Uh, so it's only natural, I think, that there's a high level of competition, you know, if not most of it, uh, you know, you know, short of conflict in those global commons. That, that's the maritime domain, and the maritime domain includes the airspace over the water. Um, I think that's where norms are going to be challenged when no one's looking. And the takeaway really is you've got to be there. Presence matters. Presence ensures peace. And uh, the work of the, the U.S. Navy in, in uh, my AOR uh, is, is really aimed at that. And if we can't be there all the time by ourselves, we're going to rely on that strong network of allies and partners to make sure that we're covering down on it so that uh, uh, any potential adversary is going to get called out when they're breaking those international norms. We don't allow a uh, normalization of behavior that's not right, and that we also show that we have the capacity, the capability, and most importantly, I think the will to defend ourselves as an alliance, as, as a partnership. So, Frank, again, thanks for the opportunity. I look, I'm really looking forward to the questions. Well, thanks, Admiral Burke. Uh, my, my, my takeaway from what you just said is that there's a lot going on, um, and so. Uh, when we sit back here in the United States and um, we read the paper about what's going on, uh, what are the priorities? I mean, how, how do you do everything uh, when so much is important? Can you give us an idea of what your priorities are? Absolutely. I've issued some, uh, you know, I call it commander's guidance, uh, just speaking broadly in terms of intent. And there are some finer points on this that I'll come back to, but really you could put it in two large bins. Um, the first bin is we've got to be ready to fight tonight. Uh, every time a ship gets underway, uh, an aircraft squadron deploys, uh, or you know a sortie takes off off the off the uh, deck of an aircraft carrier, um, that CO, that that crew, that that unit has to be leaving with the mindset of they might be going to war. Um, it's a mindset of readiness all the time, taking the right stuff with you, being in the right state of training, and taking it seriously. Um, there's no such thing as a, you know, an open ocean pleasure cruise. They're going to go out there and they're going to get tested. Um, and they're getting tested every day in, in ways that I think, um, I think the American people would be um, you know, somewhat um, interested in, but also very proud of the way that our, our, our ships, our, our sailors handle the situation. So this be ready to fight tonight is sort of the number one priority, number one bin. The second uh, priority is the corollary to that, which is if we've got time to get ready for the fight, let's use it wisely. Let's set the theater, as I call it. Let's put the right things in the right places so that we could fight a battle on our terms. And I'm going to be una unabashed about it. I don't want to stack the deck because I don't want it to be a fair fight. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're working on 24-7, uh, using every, every second and every resource that we have available to us. So I kind of break those two points down a little bit further into a, into a couple uh, finer points, which would be, hey, uh, this, is, this is great power competition, so let's sharpen our competitive edge. Let's think like competitors. Let's look the competitor in the eye, be confident, and, uh, and let them know that we mean business. And, and we do that in a number of ways. As, as I mentioned earlier, I think the most important one is being there. You gotta be there to compete. Right. And uh, presence really matters. Um, we've been uh, maneuvering our forces in, in some pretty, uh, I think, creative ways, given the numbers of forces that we have available to us. 
And I will tell you that um, naval power is uniquely suited to be in the right place at the right time with the right combination of power. We're making a point of letting the other guys know that we can and will do that, and, and we're showing up to compete. Um, I, I think that's probably the, you know, the number one thing, our changes in our operating patterns along those lines. Uh, the second point of uh, specificity would be this importance of this transatlantic um, security tie. Uh, the NATO alliance is really the strategic center of gravity for the defense of, uh, of, uh, of Europe, and, and, and it really comes to play a great power competition. So there are no U.S. only operations, or very few. Um, we put a NATO flag on everything we can do, and, and that's not hard to do because our allies and partners are standing up, raising their hand, and contributing in, uh, in really meaningful ways. It's not a U.S. only show out there. Um, in Africa, the, uh, I have a priority aligned to that, and it's all about strengthening our partnerships. Uh, we work by, with, and through our African partners um, that, that are, uh, you know, that inhabit the area. But there are a lot of uh, other international uh, militaries, uh, international organizations, U.S. Uh, interagency organizations that are doing really good work there. So we partner across the board to, you know, have unity of effort in, in what we're all bringing to help uh, uh, the young African nations really become self-sufficient in terms of maritime security and protecting their resources, protecting their rights. Um, another focus area is the Arctic, ensuring security and stability in the Arctic. Um, I, uh, I did a, uh, an interview uh, last fall on this about some of the unique challenges up there, but we've got U.S. national strategic interests in the Arctic. Um, there are global strategic interests up there. The United States is an Arctic nation one of nine, and uh, you know, Russia's posturing to uh, preclude uh, freedom of the seas up there. China claims to be an Arctic nation. Last time I looked at the map, the nearest point of China to the Arctic Circle is about 900 nautical miles, so I don't buy that. But they want to be up there, they want to be present to give themselves legitimacy, and they want to have a, an impact on how uh, the resources are, are sort of doled out in that area. Uh, so again, uh, presence, got to be present in the Arctic. The uh, United States has been present in the Arctic for a long time. I hope we could talk a little bit more about that later. Mm -hmm. But we've been present in a much more visible way in the last year uh, as part of the uh, uh, Navy's Arctic strategy. And then the last point on my guidance is this idea of enhancing our operational capability in every way at every opportunity. Um, because we don't do things alone, we're always partnering with another Navy. That gives us a chance to practice our interoperability. And we're taking this idea of interoperability, being able to, you know, in soldiers' terms, shoot, move, and com communicate uh, with each other uh, as a team. We're changing it into interoperability, such that I could put a, a UK um, destroyer or frigate with a United States battle, uh, carrier battle group and have them do the air defense mission for that strike group completely seamlessly. We're doing it with the French, we're doing it with a lot of different allies and partners over there, and then we're practicing. We're refining our tactics, our techniques, procedures, how we would fight together. And we're questioning ourselves, learning, mm -hmm. and in the process, getting better. Um, so always working to improve ourselves, being a learning organization um, with our partners as well. So that's kind of the, the thrust of it, um, easier said than done. Yeah, it was, uh, I'm, I'm really struck by, uh, even in the priorities world, everything you have going on. And, and you mentioned NATO a couple times there in, in a conversation. It's such a big part of, of what you do. H how does the, the um, Allied Joint Force Command, how does that fit into your Navy role as commander of the Naval Forces in Europe and Africa? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. It's the, the, the uh, headquarters command and control is a little uh, complicated. Um, a lot of good reasons for that, uh, but uh, it, it gives me some great uh, opportunities. And my, my U.S. hat, I'm commander of U.S. Naval Forces in both Europe, so in the United States European Command Area Responsibility, that's General Todd Walter's command, and then Naval Forces Africa for the U.S. AFRICOM Area Responsibility, uh, General Steve Townsend. Uh, so I work for both of those two U.S. geographic combatant commanders. Uh, so that gets me from the Arctic to the 
southern tip of, um, of the African continent and from the middle of the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. It includes the Med, uh, the Black Sea, the Baltic, the Norwegian Sea, the, the Barents, uh, all the things that you, you would think go with that. As a NATO commander, uh, you, you, you've got the title uh, exactly right. It's Allied uh, Joint Force Command Naples. I'm a, sort of the equivalent of a U.S. geographic combatant commander. So I have a geographic area, which is you know, Southern Europe landmass, and then the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, and now uh, expanding uh, as NATO takes on uh, interest in what happens in Africa and the impacts it can have on uh, NATO nations on the European continent. So uh, a geographic area of responsibility, but with uh, joint forces, so land, sea, and air forces all working for me. Uh, 104 countries in the AOR, 23% of the world's population, about 14 million uh, square miles of land, about 30% um, of the uh, Earth's land mass. Uh, the last count, I think it was around 20 uh, million square nautical miles of of ocean and about 67% of the Earth's coastline. So, wow. big AOR, um, uh, not, not the biggest, but it, it's a big one. Um, and, and when you really think about it, why I keep saying this, using this sketch phrase, that it's a crossroads of, of uh, transatlantic security. And I think uh, to an extent, um, uh, global security, especially when you know, we watch what happened with Suez Canal getting blocked uh, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, a month, month and a half ago. Um, you know, the, the trade that flows through the Med, uh, you know, uh, to the uh, Indian Ocean, it really is a Eastern uh, civilization, Western civilization uh, crossroads, both on land and at sea. So as to how the jobs align, um, which I think really was the point of your question, it, it's a fantastic alignment because as a U.S. commander, I have uh, tremendous um, resources at my disposal in terms of uh, the ships, airplanes, submarines, uh, expeditionary forces of the, of the best Navy the world's ever seen. And our allies and partners um, really want to work with us every time we're there. So this idea of putting a NATO flag and everything we do, that's easy for me. I just got to let them know uh, in enough time to plan about it and, you know, they come, they join in. And in the process, we get this benefit of training. We get this synergy of operating together and training like we might have to fight uh, perhaps one day. So my two headquarters are, are separate and distinct, the U.S. side and the NATO side, but they're in the same you know, general area, vicinity of Naples, Italy. And, um, and they're working together um, you know, live and virtual every day to make sure that, that these operations happen the, that the way we need them to. So you mentioned the, the great power competition. So in the context of the great uh, power competition, I, I, let, let's zero down into wh what is the biggest threat? Um, I, like, I, I think we, we kind of have an idea, but, but the biggest threat in Europe and Africa and, and, uh, and what are we trying to do? We've got a, a lot of resources, perhaps not enough, but resources, uh, in the AOR, in the context, what's the United States trying to do there in the theater? Yeah, well, again, at the, um, at the most fundamental level, this competition is about, um, you know, as we talk about in national defense strategy, a resurgence of revisionist powers. They want to um, rewrite, the, one, expand their influence and power throughout Europe and Africa, as well as other parts of the world. But in the process, they want to uh, sort of rewrite the rule book as they're doing it, uh, rewrite the rule book in ways that are not favorable to free and open trade, free and open societies uh, in, in an international rules-based order. Um, and our national defense strategy says that we're going to be there to compete with them, to check them, and um, uh, we're going to uphold international rule of law and, and norms for behavior. Um, you take a look at Russia, uh, for example. At the most basic level, what they're really kind of doing is bullying, bullying their way into believing the Russian government's narrative. Uh, you take a look uh, at things, that the way they behave, they, they act as though the Black Sea is a Russian Great Lake. Uh, and that no other nations have a, have a right to operate there, and they frequently take actions that, that, that show that 
they want that to be the case. Uh, but it's international waters. All nations have a right to be there, so we go there, and our allies and partners go with us um, or by themselves because we're, we need to challenge that. We need to challenge that narrative and not let that become the norm. Um, China, uh, similar story, um, a di different story, I would say, but no less concerning. Uh, China's present in both Europe and Africa, economically and militarily, but uh, a lot of their activity is sort of along the lines of the, the efforts associated with their Belt and Road Initiative, and uh, you take a look at uh, their influence in Africa. Uh, they're in 52 of 54, the African nations, uh, and they have a, a, uh, a technique of going in and using predatory um, financial practices to lure young nations into signing a deal with them. And um, those nations really don't get any benefit for the economic well-being of their people. And in some cases, they're signing away more than what they realize when they perhaps default on a payment or, or things of that nature, uh, all the way to the point of maybe giving up sovereignty of part of their nations, which we've seen from China in, in a number of cases. Um, China's in Europe, too. Um, they have a controlling interest in 15 European ports. Uh, but I think probably one of the more insidious concerns I have about China is this um, uh, safe city electronic surveillance infrastructure that's uh, really spreading throughout European nations. Those cities are being monitored 24-7, you know, video surveillance of entire, you know, uh, cities. Uh, um, you know, I don't think it's a stretch to think that the, that the Chinese will would or will or maybe even are using that to their advantage. Is that right? I think though the thing to keep in perspective is despite sort of narrative that that Russia and China are uh, you know joining forces and they are doing so in some I would say um, ceremonial ways uh, for the purpose of you know their own information campaign but the fundamental fact is they're still both operating unilaterally and alone. And I come back to this idea of the, the power of an alliance with 30 nations, 30 nations capability, capacity, uh, will, and, uh, and uh, you know, willingness to use that. So uh, those, are, those are the biggest threats, I think. Um, Africa really is sort of an emerging front uh, on this great power competition um, game. And all of us, uh, whether Europeans, Americans, uh, or other nations, have a vested interest in seeing how this comes out. So you mentioned the, the cities in uh, in Europe uh, being monitored and all that. Uh, how's NATO doing? How, how's our relationship uh, with NATO uh, been in the news uh, yeah. recently? Um, uh, what's your take on the relationship between NATO and the United States at this point? Uh, it's good. It's very good. It's uh, the U.S. commitment to, to NATO is is rock solid. It's, it's ironclad, and I think uh, President Biden's uh, uh, reaffirmation of that uh, a few weeks ago in Europe was uh, was uh, very important and, and, and went a long way to uh, you know boost confidence in that fact. I don't think the confidence ever ever waned on the military military front, uh, but. You got to look at, at NATO. It, it's the largest and most successful alliance in the world's history. You know, 70 plus years of uh, of working together. You know, this this idea of common uh, shared principles, shared values, um, and uh, shared experience. Frankly, you know, coming out of World War II, that was the formation of the alliance, and then this vision of of again what right looks like, where where the free world ought to go. So, again, we try and reaffirm that commitment by operating as part of NATO every day. And every time we do that, I think we're building trust. We're helping to improve each other's capabilities. We learn from NATO nations just like they learn from the U.S. And, and then just training like we're going to fight uh, as an alliance, as a partnership. Because nobody can do this alone. This is the, the challenges are too big. Yeah, that's great to hear the alliance is... Uh is doing well and strong, and especially at the Navy to Navy, military to military level, that 
those relationships exist. Let's take this to the fleet. Um, we have a question uh, from the fleet, uh, Seaman Joseph Diaz uh, from the Arley, uh, USS Arley Burke. Uh, let's go to the fleet and uh, see what, uh, what uh, Seaman Diaz wants to know. What is the future of four deployed destroyers in Rota, and how do you see them playing part of maritime strategy in this AOR? Well, I'm not sure I could ask a question like that uh, when I was a uh, junior, but uh, that's a great question, and, and it really takes us right down to what's going on in, uh, in the AOR. Uh, yeah, think uh, that's a great question, and it was good to see uh, Seaman Diaz right there on the pier in uh, Rota. Um, I'll tell you, the future is bright for our forward deployed naval forces in Europe. Um, those ships um, are workhorses. Uh, they have a, a very high operating tempo. Uh, they're an integral part of uh, the European uh, ballistic missile defense system, and they have both U.S. and, and NATO missions uh, along those lines. And again, the Arleigh Burke is an extremely capable multi-mission warship. Uh, they're doing uh, things from the Arctic all the way down to, uh, you know, the, the Cape of Good Hope. So, you know, we couldn't do this without the, the fantastic partnership of Spain. So we're really grateful that, that Spain has partnered with us in hosting those four DDGs. And, and being home ported in Rota means we can stay there. We're, we're part of the European um, military force, we're part of the European naval force. We're integrated 100%. We're always there. Uh, and that helps us really build upon those relationships, uh, you know, with all of those navies out there. Uh, the future is we intend to main a force level of DDGs in Rota. Um, it's not going to get smaller. Um, as we rotate, we're just about um, three quarters of the way done with our rotation. The first original set of four ships that went out there. Uh, we'll finish up uh, sometime in 2022, but we're bringing a uh, newer generation Arleigh Burke class destroyers out there. With it, their improved capabilities on their Aegis uh, combat systems, which, you know, integrated air and missile defense and ballistic missile defense capabilities are, you know, state of the art. And uh, their helo carrying capacity, which really, really adds a whole new toolbox uh, instead of, uh, uh, set of uh, uh, tools to the to the uh, warfight kit. So we've got Hilo squadrons moving out to, to Rota uh, to support the, those missions, and uh, the future is very bright. So uh, staying there with the future and the, and the, the force structure, and, and I kind of want to bring that bring. Uh, uh, we have a question here about the the Black Sea. You've mentioned Russia and, and the Black Sea a little bit. You mentioned uh, uh, Russia in the Arctic. Um, Seabreeze uh, kind of uh, drew some attention and uh, some pretty stark reactions from Russia. Can, can you tell us about what, what happened there and, and the situation with Russia, the Black Sea? Yeah, well, for Seabreeze was, uh, was a fantastic uh, exercise, uh, you know, jointly uh, sponsored by the uh, U.S. and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. 32 nations participated this year, which is the uh, largest participation uh, we've ever seen, including, uh, you know, nations from the South Pacific. Uh, not just uh, NATO allies and partners. Um, so I think that goes a long way in, in this idea of we've got to challenge uh, this behavior that, that seeks to, you know, set new norms, uh, the number of nations that were willing to be there. But um, I, I think if the American public had more details or could stack up the details that, you know, show up as a random press clipping here and there and look at the uh, uh, scope and breadth of uh, Russia's operations like this, I think they'd be, um, they'd be understandably concerned. And I think we should be because the Russian government is still very much an existential threat to the United States. And I'm saying the Russian government. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's as much of a threat today as the Soviet Union was in the Cold War. Is that right? They've, they've heavily modernized their weapon systems, um, their submarine force, over the last 10 to 20 years, they watched as, uh, as we uh, fought uh, two uh, land campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan. They learned from us. Um, their learning curve uh, is much shorter than ours, and they're operating very differently. That said, they're, they're not 10 feet tall. They uh, understand and respect the capabilities of the United States and NATO, and they understand that we're capable of defending ourselves. And I think a lot of what you hear from 
President Putin and his ret rhetoric is, is maybe aimed at his domestic audience for his own, own political purposes. But I think the real threat here is this constant um, bullying by the Russians. You know, in the extreme, changing borders by force like they did with the illegal annexation of Crimea yeah. in 2014, which shows us what they're willing to do if they think they can get away with it. Uh, but in sort of the day-to-day, -day, it's denying nations access to international waters, huge military buildups uh, in the North Atlantic, in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, uh, the Arctic, the Black Sea in the Eastern Mediterranean, and then the threats that go along with those huge military uh, buildups. And ultimately, that results in some nations avoiding going to those areas, which is exactly the behavior change that the Russians are seeking. They want to be in control of those waters, uh, that, that, that they're there for their own exclusive use. Uh, we can't cede that to the Russians. You think about it, China does the same thing in the South China Sea, right? They're building their own mm -hmm. stationary aircraft carriers, these um, uh, coral islands. They're designating them as their own uh, sovereign territory and then they're drawing lines around them and if people get too close, um, they threat, threaten with violence. Um, so in Seabreeze, um, you know, we saw this play out in a number of different ways, but I think a good example is you know, there are certain courtesies you do before you, you hold a, an exercise with 32 nations um, in an area like the Black Seas. We do it worldwide. It's, a, it's an international law thing. You give notice to the mariners that might be passing through those areas and the airmen and let them know what's going on so they can make an informed choice of do they provide some distance, do they look and see what's going on first, do they check in and ask if we're firing live weapons. So um, we did that about three weeks before Sea Breeze. Um, now fast forward three weeks, we're in the middle of the execution of Sea Breeze. The Russians announce closure areas. That's not new. They've always done that since the Cold War. And they basically say, we're closing off. They use a little different term, not consistent with international law, but they say, we're going to close off this section of the Black Sea for our exclusive use. Just stay out. Um, again, not new, but during Sea Breeze, they closed off the entire uh, western half of the Black Sea. If it weren't so threatening, it would be laughable, kind of akin to a five-year-old temper tantrum, but yeah. um, that's the kind of thing that, that, that we're talking about. Other than, you know, the, uh, the uh, intercepts by their armed aircraft, um, their, uh, their ships that, that uh, come out and intercept and, and shadow our forces, U.S., NATO, allies and partners operating uh, in that area by themselves. Uh, are constantly shadowed by, by Russian vessels. Um, and, you know, by and large, those interactions are safe and professional, although they're meant to intimidate. When a, mm -hmm. a strike aircraft overflies, you know, a, a destroyer at 100 feet altitude and, and right over top, our COs are making a judgment call of whether that strike fighter is on an attack profile or not. You know, it could be argued that they're baiting us into shooting first. We're not going to do that first without provocation, but I'm also not going to ask my commanding officers to take the first shot on the chin. So there's a tactical risk involved here. That tactical risk could turn into a strategic issue, and that's a big concern with this increasing aggressiveness. So um, we'll, we'll have to watch that very closely. We talk about it a lot with our skippers and our crews. They're very proud of the way the, the, the U.S. Navy and, and the uh, Allied navies uh, in the in the area have, have operated. We're not going to flinch, uh, and we're not going to take the bait. Admiral Burke, this is a an absolutely great conversation. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we're going to come back in uh, just a short amount of time. We've got some good questions coming in uh, uh, on the platform. We also have uh, still have some questions from uh, from the fleet. We want to get in, so we'll take a quick break, and uh, we'll be right back. Doing the right thing what matters most but sometimes bad things happen when they do we all need someone who does the right thing and that's navy mutual the lone sailor a powerful symbol of the sacrifice of sea service personnel past present and future for more than two decades the navy memorial has placed 16 of these iconic figures around the country and the world 
Now you can contribute to this story tradition and help place our next statue at one of the most significant battlefields of the 20th century, the D-Day beaches of Normandy. Be a part of history and help ensure their sacrifice is never forgotten. Make your tax-deductible donation today. Welcome back, and uh, I'm glad uh, glad we have Admiral Burke. What a great conversation we're having here, Admiral. Thank you very much. Keep the questions coming in on the platform, uh, and, uh, and like I said, we're going to go a couple more questions to the fleet. And matter of fact, let's go right to the fleet. Uh, we have a question from uh, from Petty Officer First Class Mott, who's out there on, on the Navier staff. And uh, let's take the questions down a little bit to uh, to Africa. How is the USS Arleigh Burke's transition into theater, and how was the USS Donald Cook's transition out? Hey, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the transition was absolutely seamless. Um, and, and I'm very excited about the, uh, the capability that these new uh, uh, ships are bringing, uh, modernized ships, I should say, in the case of Arleigh uh, Burke, since she's the class leader, but Aegis Combat System, Baseline nine upgrades uh, gives us so much capability in uh, ballistic missile defense, integrated air missile defense, and even anti-submarine warfare capability. And, and, and ASW is, a, is, is big on my mind with the Russian submarine force. Um, the DDGs are the absolute pillar of the European um, phased adaptive approach uh, and NATO's robust integrated air missile uh, defense architecture. When Arleigh Burke showed up, uh, before she even uh, got to visit Rhoda, we, we threw her into an exercise called uh, Black Toro, which was a, an international um, anti-submarine warfare exercise. She integrated completely uh, seamlessly, completely flawlessly, as if she'd been in the theater for, for years. So it was just really, I think, a testament to the training and certification process and also the, the hard work and uh, dedication of that crew and understanding where they're going to go operate and uh, what their missions are going to be. Um, Donald Cook uh, departed uh, Rhoda at the uh, beginning of the month, and uh, you know she is a fantastic ship and crew. And uh, you know dur during her tenure, she provided fantastic support to our allies and partners. Uh, did things all the way from the Arctic uh, to, to South Africa, and, uh, and and made a difference. And I really think Donald Cook's tenure there really exemplified not only the uh, the value of our deployed naval forces. Uh, our ability to project power and, uh, and and work with allies, but you know just that fact of being where it matters when it matters at sea. So uh, Admiral, we threw you for a loop there. We we uh, I thought we were going to a question from the fleet about Africa. Let's go to that question from Petty Officer Mott about Africa. Um, Petty Officer Mott uh, from the Navier staff has has a, a good question. I'd like to shift the conversation down a little bit. Talk a little bit more about Africa. Let's go to the fleet and uh, Petty Officer Mott. How would you define our Navy's role within the AFRICOM AOR? What does our future look like for our partner navies within this region? So, so we're, we're going to be a little short on time here before. Uh, so I, what I'd like to ask you is kind of give us your perspective on Petty Officer Mott's question. Um, uh, maybe you want to... Uh, Talk a little bit about what Gulf of Guinea, I guess, is, is, so, is, a, is one of the areas where I think you've, uh, you and I chatted about before a little bit. Um, so kind of give us a, a lay down there of the Africom, Africa situation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, to, if I could, I'll start with uh, uh, Professor uh, Mott's original question, which I think is, what is it that we're actually doing down there? And um, I think at the end of the day, it's about building partner capacity, uh, said in plain English. Um, helping those young African nations become self-sufficient at looking out for their own interests in the maritime, uh, defending their territorial waters, and, and, and uh, protecting their natural resources in their exclusive economic zones. Now, in my naval hat, I'm dealing mostly with the coastal African nations, so that's, that's why the focus there. And, and I really think that, at the end of the day, this building partner capacity thing is all about 
making two plus two equal five. You want to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. make the parts, some of the parts, uh, you know, a larger whole. Um, and by being down there, this helps give us a, a leg up on all the activities the Chinese and, and the Russians are, are uh, endeavoring in, in, in places like Africa because none of our competitors can replicate um, what the U.S. brings, our, our capability, our capacity, the leadership we provide, the training, and, um, and, and frankly, the drawing power to get other allies and partners down there and interested in it. Um, we, you know, it's a, it's a huge continent. Uh, people don't realize you could fit three continental United States maps inside the, the, the area of, uh, of Africa, and the coastline is tremendously large. And, and some of those navies are, um, you know, just getting uh, started. Uh, but we're going to be there and help them. Uh, we're going to work with them uh, and, uh, and, and help them make the progression. And uh, we'll do that by working with international partners, African partners, and, uh, you know, our, our fellow naval services, the Marine Corps, and, and the Coast Guard as well. So you mentioned the Gulf of Guinea. Um, you know, we've got uh, things going on all over the, the coast of Africa, but we run a annual express uh, series in three different locations in the Gulf of Guinea. It's, it's a big annual exercise called Obengami Express in, um, in, in East Africa. Uh, it's the uh, Cutlass Express series. And then uh, in North Africa along the Mediterranean, it's uh, Phoenix Express. But we use those exercises as sort of centerpieces, uh, annual school grade graduation level exercise for the training that goes on with not just the U.S. being down there, but our other allies and partners. It's sort of a validation. And I look at, you know, the threats that the Gulf of Guinea uh, has to deal with on a, on a daily basis. It's, it's piracy. It's uh, trafficking of arms, narcotics, uh, humans. Um, it's illegal, uh, unreported, unregulated fishing uh, by government fleets, like the Chinese government's fishing fleet, robbing these uh, Gulf of Guinea nations of their natural resources, uh, you know, their fisheries, fishing them out, uh, you know, in an irresponsible manner. Uh, so, you know, by working together with uh, allies, partners, the U.S. Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, which brings unique capabilities like law enforcement, we're able to um, uh, help them become self-sufficient. Um, you know, I was involved in this uh, six years ago, last time I worked at Naval Forces Europe in Africa, and coming back now and seeing the difference is, um, is eye-watering. There is a network of maritime operating centers in the Gulf of Guinea. Each of those nations has their own, and they've coordinated and established a regional maritime operations center for the purpose of sharing resources between the, the, the young and resource-constrained navies along the Gulf of Guinea and being able to go out and interdict these illicit activities and then bring them to justice. They're passing laws that help them uh, bring to justice uh, piracy uh, types of crimes. Last fall, there was a pr particularly noteworthy one where we saw the whole thing come together. We had, and it was a good story in terms of uh, joint effort, the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency, and um, uh, there is a, a, a NATO intelligence fusion center for the purpose of counter narcotics in Lisbon, Portugal got together, provided some queuing to this regional maritime operating center in the Gulf of Guinea that um, there was a Chinese trawler uh, uh, doing some illicit activities, some uh, drug smuggling in the area, uh, and some piracy uh, types of stuff. And those nations got together, successfully interdicted it, um, took the, um, uh, you know, the operators of this Chinese trawler uh, conducting this illicit activity, and arrested them. Nigeria had, you know, only months before passed laws that allowed them to bring to prosecution those criminals. Um, they did that all by themselves. So I think the future is bright for the uh, the nations of Africa. They're they're learning every day. They're they're, they're growing their navies. Um, this is a, a threat to their security. It's a threat to their natural resources. It. It's a threat to their ability to economically develop, uh, d develop uh, you know, on a fair playing field. And ultimately, that trade not happening freely impacts the entire world. So uh, 
you know, we, 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 we focus a lot on Europe, and it's interesting to hear that perspective and, and that impact, quite frankly, um, that isn't in the front page of the news that, <coughs> that uh, you know, you made an earlier comment about chips and being there, you have to be there, and, it, and that kind of thing doesn't happen in Africa unless you're there and you have those relationships and you're able to do that. Let's take it back to the fleet. Um, uh, let's go to Petty Officer uh, Boston's Bay Third Class, uh, Alexis Gutierrez. Um, and uh, I think this is a question a little bit about, uh, quite frankly, uh, the fleet out there. So uh, let's go to, uh, to, to uh, Petty, Petty Officer Gutierrez, uh, over to the fleet. What role do you see for USS Herschel Woody Williams in the future in this AOR? So, so Woody Williams, uh, I'll ask you to tell us a little bit about Woody yeah. Williams too. And, and also we have a, a question from the fleet here that, you know, I, I, when I think of Woody Williams, I think of, of the future. And uh, uh, there's a question from uh, a first class hull technician, Bill Garner out there, uh, about repair ships, tenders, and, and things like that. So as you talk about uh, the Woody Williams and its contribution, could you talk also about uh, the fleet in general, what's, what's going on in the Met? Sure, sure. Yeah, Herschel uh, Woody Williams, uh, absolutely phenomenal capability. Um, you know, she's been in theater for uh, just over a year now. Um, circumnavigated Africa. Um, did some phenomenal operations uh, uh, off the coast of Somalia last year as we were repositioning U.S. forces there. But, you know, it's a ESB, is her designation, Expeditionary Support Base. You think of it as a base you can park anywhere you want to off the coast of Africa. Uh, she's got flight decks, you can carry troops, you can carry humanitarian assistance, disaster relief types of capabilities. Um, and w what she's been used for most uh, in Africa is, is bringing those training forces to bear to help those young African navies uh, become more and more self-sufficient and, uh, and participate in those types of things. But Somalia was a good example of, you know, at one point we had a carrier strike group, an amphibious ready group there providing cover as U.S. forces uh, repositioned there. And, uh, you know, we were able to free up the aircraft carrier uh, and ultimately the amphibious ready group, the, the amphibs and the marines, to do other things because uh, uh, Woody Williams was there uh, carrying, um, you know, uh, CV-22s with the Army Special Forces on board. Um, we were providing air cover, we were, we were pro providing quick reaction forces and, and uh, personnel recovery forces uh, uh, for uh, the later portions of, of the uh, repositioning. So tremendously flexible uh, uh, vessel. And, um, and she's participated in exercises, the ones I mentioned before, like Obengami Express off Gulf of Guinea, um, uh, Phoenix Express. Uh, France leads an exercise in the Gulf of Guinea called uh, Grand African Nemo, and the U.S. Uh, participates heartily in that one. And then, um, you know, helping those nations by being there, being the eyes and ears, and helping provide cueing when we see illicit activity going on as well. So uh, she continues to do a lot of operations uh, of that nature with our African partners. She's just getting ready to deploy again, um, you know, about to have a change of command uh, for her uh, second operational CO soon. And right after that, she'll do another circumnavigation of the African continent. And uh, we get a lot of mileage out of, you know, just being there with all of our African partners and, uh, and working with each of them. Uh, to your other question, um, you know, again, I, I look at it in terms of those four DDGs. You know, they're in the eastern Mediterranean challenging the Russians who've moved into Syria. They're in the Black Sea. Um, they're in the Arctic. They're down in South Africa making sure that, you know, we know how to and we have options for logistics around South Africa. You know, if the Suez Canal becomes unavailable. Not hard to imagine after watching that uh, tanker run around there uh, that somebody could deliberately take that out of service. So we have to know how to be able to operate that way. Um, so a lot of different uses and, and I think a lot of different, um, you know, good news stories about how we're using the forces and uh, how we use additional forces when they're, when they're available for us. So, uh, Admiral Burke, let's go to the uh, question from the audience. We've got uh, John Doyle's asking uh, about COVID-19. And uh, the pandemic hit, hit uh, all the forces hard, uh, um, had a large impact on, on, on your AOR. 
Um, how, how do you think the sailors performed? What impact did it have on you all? And, and uh, as you, as hopefully we start to look at this thing in, in the mirror, realizing there's some countries that, that aren't where we are with it, uh, many in your AOR. Um, but from a sailor's perspective, as you start to look back, how did the sailors do during COVID? Well, I'll tell you, um, I couldn't be prouder of how the uh, our, our U.S. Navy sailors uh, worked their way through this. Um, the personal responsibility that they demonstrated, the um, sacrifices that they had to make to, you know, add weeks of, you know, restriction of movement on before a deployment, after a deployment, foregoing a lot of Liberty ports because we just couldn't go into those places. Uh, we got creative where we could and provided some isolated areas, pier side, to let them get off uh, the ship for short periods of time. But, you know, we had uh, ships, uh, crews out there for, um, you know, six, seven months at a time without making a, a port call. And uh, there were no complaints. And uh, their families gave up uh, a lot as well, a lot more time that their service members were gone, their sailors were out to sea or in restriction of movement so they could go do their job. Um, the families uh, losing the flexibility that we're typically able to provide them on uh, U.S. Department of Defense installations overseas. Um, you know, we honored our host nation's uh, rules and regulations, uh, even uh, in some cases after, you know, U.S. vaccinations were available. Uh, if they weren't available in those nations, we weren't going to, you know, do something different and, uh, and flaunt our uh, situation with our host nation. We wanted to be respectful of that. But that resulted in more sacrifice for our families. Um, I, I tell you, I'm also proud of it because we took a look um, as a Navy, and, and I'm really proud that the Navy's a learning organization. I had a lot of skin in the COVID game early on when I was still vice chief. I did. Mm -hmm two investigations into the, the Theodore Roosevelt issue, you know, and um, as a resu result of that and the whole way that the Navy um, quickly turned to uh, uh, regarding operations of pandemic, we were able to revalidate and refine our procedures for operating ships, very close, uh, you know, environment with, uh, you know, limited airflow. So a lot of concerns you have to work through and we learned how to do that. and. You know, at the end of the day, it was all about personal responsibility, use of PPE, social distancing, um, washing hands, sanitizing things, just really basic stuff. You got to be good at the basics. And uh, our sailors did that. And, and the proof is in the pudding. Um, you know, on any given day, since I've been in the United States Navy, which is, you know, 40 years now, um, we've kept 100 ships, roughly, give or take, you know, uh, single digit numbers forward deployed on any given day in the U.S. Navy. Our Navy's gotten a lot smaller, we're starting to grow again, but 100 ships deployed on a given day. That number didn't change during COVID. And I, I just think it's a testament to uh, our sailors, our medical community's uh, innovation and ability to rapid turn uh, medical understanding of COVID to operationalized procedures and processes that allowed us to protect ourselves and our, and our sailors executed brilliantly. So that's amazing. So we're, what, a year and a half through this pandemic now, and, and we have the commander of naval forces in Europe, Europe and Africa saying we continue to operate um, like we've been operating. That, that's just incredible. We didn't skip a beat. So we're, we're starting to run out of time here. This has been a, uh, a wonderful conversation, and um, we've heard a lot about uh, Europe, Africa, we've heard about Russia, uh, China in the theater. The, your theater, east to west, north to south, uh, is huge and complex. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, where we have looked to as a nation for a long time, uh, looking east. Um, I, I just want to get r right to it. A um, lot going on. Do you have the resources you need? Um, do you have the forces you need? You know, we hear back in Washington a lot of talk about the size of the Navy and, and the budget battles and all that, but from your perspective, from the fleet perspective, um, well, let me just ask you straight up, do we need more forces in Europe and the Africa uh, Navy Theater uh, to do what we need to do uh, as a nation? 
Well, thanks for the question, Frank. I think no matter how I answer it, it's going to sound parochial, but I'll, I'm going to try and, and give it give this to you as, as objectively as I can. Um, Europe and Africa are still, I would say, by comparison, using the you know sort of the Department of Defense terminology, we're still a little bit of an economy of force theater. There's a lot of reasons for that, but I think the discussions surrounding um, uh, you know, national defense strategy are moving in the right direction. They're, we're coming around to the, um, the reality of, of, of the threats that are being faced in that theater right now. Today, we're doing a lot of creative and I would say elegant things with our allies and partners, and, and we're getting it done. We operate very differently in, uh, in the European AOR against Russia than the U.S. Navy does, let's say, in the Pacific. A lot of reasons for that. Different ally structure, different partner structure, mm -hmm. different threat. But um, we're making it work. Um, but we also have to keep in mind this is the competition phase. If competition doesn't go our way and competition becomes conflict, um, I think we're going to be able to rely on those allies and partners. But we may not, there might be a time, there might be a time period while an individual national government's going through its deliberations and whether they're gonna gonna participate. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to count on doing the same thing in competition when it comes time for conflict. Um, uh, so that's one thing that gives me pause. And, and, and I made this point when we started, but again I just I don't I, I don't think I could say it enough because I don't think it's appreciated widely enough. Great power competition takes place in the global commons. The global commons are the maritime and um, that's the high seas. It's the international airspace above the high seas. And, um, you know, it, it, this really hit home to me. I was having a conversation. I was up at uh, General Walters UCOM headquarters uh, meeting with uh, the other uh, component commanders, the other service components that work for General Walters. And I was talking with my uh, uh, Army teammates up there, and we were talking about what was going on in the Black Sea and some of the nuances of maritime law about, you know, interactions, what's safe, what's unsafe, what's professional, what's unprofessional, and what are the, you know, international laws that pertain to these kinds of interaction. And, um, and uh, they said to me, hey, this is, this is really complicated. I just didn't have an appreciation for how up close and personal the U.S. Navy is uh, with these guys every day. Mm -hmm. um, that's competition. You know, it was that way in the Cold War. We're right back in it right now, each and every day. And um, I, and I think um, that he he finished the sentence on. We don't do that in the Army. If if we're that close to the other guy's army, we're, we're at war. Mm -hmm. We don't operate that way day in and day. And that's the difference of the domains. So I think being able to compete and prevail in competition in the maritime is going to be key to preventing war and I, I think the nation needs to look at it through that lens and decide if it wants to invest in a navy that's able to compete and win in the competition phase so that we don't have to go to the conflict phase. Pretty stark words, Admiral. So uh, I think we're about out of time. Let's, uh, let's go to the fleet one more time. Uh, last question uh, and, uh, and take it down to the, to the shipboard level. Uh, to uh, Lieutenant Nicholas Junker uh, out there at Navier. Um, has a question. Uh, I think he may have heard you speak once or twice before. Uh, so uh, let's go to Lieutenant Junker uh, out to the fleet. We've heard you share your stories of the USS Johnson, World War II, and fighting hurt. What advice would you give to the next generation of sailors in fighting future wars? That's kind of a perfect wrap-up uh, question. Um, uh, especially come, uh, coming off what you just said about uh, the need for forces. Uh, USS Johnson, what's, why does that mean something to you? Yeah, well, Nick, thanks for uh, asking that question. I, I do like to tell that story, uh, and I think it's a great story. And frankly, uh, I can't figure out why it hasn't been made into a, a movie uh, yet. It's about uh, USS Johnston. Uh, it's commanded by a, a Native American uh, by the name of Ernest Evans, and uh, he enlisted. Uh, in 1932, got recognized by a skipper. I can't remember. It was it was a short period of time, like two years later, and a skipper helped him get an appointment to the United States Naval Academy. Kind of unheard of uh, at that time. 
uh, in our society that that, that that would happen. But it really centers on Johnston's participation in the battle off Samar in, in uh, Lady Gulf. Uh, Johnston was Evans' second uh, Pacific Fleet Command. He had already commanded a ship through the first years of the war. Uh, when the ship was commissioned, you know, he's a combat-tested commanding officer. He had a very short change of command or, or uh, you know, uh, commissioning ceremony mm -hmm. uh, speech, and it was some, you know, words to the effect of, you know, what John Paul Jones had said, basically, hey, if anyone's not ready to go in harm's way, you know, get off now because we're going in harm's way. Um, and, and he meant it, um, you know, fast forward, uh, I think it was roughly six months after the ship was commissioned. He's, he's there um, at, at the uh, uh, Battle of Lady Gulf. Halsey's in command of this gargantuan task force, Task Force 3. He's got mission to defend uh, MacArthur's landing um, at Peleliu in the Philippines. And um, he also has secondary tasking that if the Imperial Japanese uh, Navy aircraft carriers come out, you know, he needs to eliminate them and uh, take out the, the last really threatening part of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Um, the Japanese carriers came out about a thousand miles north of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, Halsey took the vast majority of Task Force 3 with him and he left behind uh, a small task force called um, Taffy 3. It was um, six um, uh, small combatants, three destroyers, three destroyer escorts. And, um, and six, uh, what were known at the time as CVEs. They were merchant ships that had plywood decks put on them. And they, um, they carried uh, just uh, air support aircraft. So uh, aircraft that were armed just to support the, the MacArthur's landing. Uh, and in typical, um, you know, sailor fashion, the sailors, these were thin hulled steel ships the sailors uh, joked that CVE stood for combustible, vulnerable, and expendable, but they were they were floating gas cans. Um, they were they were uh, kind of vulnerable. Um, so Taffy Three is there alone defending the the six CVEs. They're providing air cover for Mac MacArthur's landing. Unbeknownst to Halsey, when he left, the uh, Navy intelligence didn't didn't uh, see this coming. Admiral Kurita, the Japanese fleet commander at the time, is coming from the south through um, uh, Surigo and uh, San Bernardino Straits with 30-some mm -hmm. uh, warships. What's left of the Imperial Japanese Navy? Uh, battleships, cruisers, and destroyers, and a lot of them. Uh, really big ships. Um, Johnston um, leads the charge, uh, turns towards the enemy, and, uh, uh, you know, Again, battleships with 18-inch guns, um, cruisers with 14-inch guns. He's got, his, he's got torpedoes and a 5-inch gun. Um, he uses up his torpedoes in the first couple rounds, does really well, sinks a cruiser and, uh, and a couple of destroyers first go around, comes around a second time, uses his remaining torpedoes. Um, they're, uh, they're getting shelled like crazy. Um, uh, you know, I think it was a second or third run. Johnston was hit with a 14-inch shell from one of the cruisers. It, it blew the bridge off the ship. Uh, Ernest Evans was hurt in the process, lost uh, part of his left hand. But, you know, in minutes he was at aft steerage, uh, manually conning the ship uh, for a third, fourth, and fifth go-around. They lost their, you know, one of their main engines and one, one side of the propulsion plant on the third go-around. And, uh, you know, just kept going uh, with only the five inch gun for those last three runs and half propulsion and manually steering the ship. The Japanese were taking pretty heavy losses given the disproportionate size of their force and uh, ultimately Admiral Curita concluded they couldn't win against, um, uh, in his words, such a determined force. Um, the, uh, you know, in the last salvo, Johnston uh, lost her second and last remaining main engine, and she was sunk uh, minutes later. Uh, I think somewhere in the ballpark, 140 of the, of the 300 crewmen um, survived. Johnston was seen on the fantail after the ship had capsized just before sinking, uh, but then he, he was never seen again. Hmm. <clears throat> so 
I tell this story really to make uh, a couple points to uh, our sailors today. First of all, I think it's the uh, textbook example of what we train to in terms of fighting the ship. The officers, mm -hmm. um, the, the weaponeers, um, you know, continuing the fight, the uh, engineering and damage control, you know, bringing back as much as possible, slowing the damage. Um, ultimately, though, this is really about um, our ability to fight hurt. And because of uh, the way ships like Johnson performed here and at other battles, um, we have an enormous capacity to fight hurt. Our ships are built to take it, and our sailors are trained to know their equipment well enough to understand how to operate around casualties, battle damage in the toughest of circumstances, and uh, you know, be ready to fight hurt because uh, the U.S. Navy's been underestimated many, many times in history, thinking that we were down for the count, and, and we kept coming back. And uh, this is a story about that. I think also the, the other point I like to make, you know, we've had these talks about uh, some of the stuff in the context of Task Force um, uh, One Navy, um, some of the um, uh, things that we've gone through with uh, uh, race discrimination, sexual harassment. Uh, none of these sailors were worried about the sailor behind their back. Um, they were looking ahead at the adversary. They, they, didn't, they didn't care where their shipmate was from. They didn't care what color their skin was. Um, they didn't care what, the, what their gender was. It's a different day and age then, so gender was, was a different challenge, but it was still a challenge even then. And, and, and most importantly, I think, they were more afraid of letting down their shipmate or their chief or their skipper or their ship than they were of the adversary. So that's why I think it's a great story. It is a great story and, uh, and a great way to wrap it up. Um, I apologize uh, for going a little over, Admiral. This has been a great conversation. Uh, I appreciate uh, your time immensely. I appreciate what you're doing out there in Europe and Africa and with NATO. Uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us, and thank you for very much for giving us this sit rep. Thanks to you, Frank, and thanks to Navy Mutual Aid as well. Thank you. Thank you. And let me, uh, let me echo on the thank you to Navy Mutual Aid. Uh, great company, uh, uh, culture, uh, all in the right place, supporting organizations like the Navy Memorial. Thank you to Navy Mutual Aid. Without them, we could not do this. I'd like to wrap up with a couple thoughts for you. Uh, the biggest thought is the Navy Memorial is back. Uh, we are open for business again. And uh, we're coming out of the, out of the pandemic, uh, trying to mimic the Navy a little bit. Not, don't let it uh, get us down and come out stronger uh, on the other end. So we're back. We're open. Uh, we're doing uh, concerts on the avenue again. If you're here in the area, we are, uh, we're doing movies on the Memorial, South Pacific, this Thursday night at dusk. And, uh, and perhaps most importantly, uh, the Lone Sailor Award Program will air on, online. On September 23rd, we're in the middle of putting that together. We're going to honor Drew Carey, uh, former Marine Sergeant Drew Carey, uh, host of uh, The Price is Right, and Chaplain Barry Black, former Chief of Chaplains and now the uh, Senate, uh, the Chaplain for the U.S. Senate. So September 3rd, tune in. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, thank Admiral Burke once again. And uh, to you all, thank you for joining us. And until the next time, fair winds and following seas. <laughs>